woke up quick at about noon. And here we are, episode number two of the podcast with Damian Barling. I am Damian Barling, and I thank you so much for being here with me on this Tuesday, June 4th. I thank you for downloading wherever, whatever service you're downloading from. I thank you for streaming over there on YouTube. You guys made day number one of the podcast with Damian Barling a massive, massive success. Uh, triple digit subscribers over there on YouTube. Uh, well over triple digits in terms of download across all sorts of platforms. You can see the uh, number of views right there on YouTube, right there on par with what we used to do uh, during the midday over at the radio station. So I greatly appreciate how many of you have migrated over uh, to this new venture I'm doing here live from the uh, Palatial Podcast Studios in my house in the beautiful suburb of Sacramento, Northern Natomas. So um, again, thank you so much. I promise I'm not going to start uh, every single podcast with a bunch of thank yous, but I feel like it's warranted here today. And uh, no, oh, and the texters, yo, that text line was by far my best idea. Uh, thank you to those who uh, took time to send in some text messages. I, I really appreciate that. I was interacting with people all day. I, I'm learning. I'm kind of learning the listening habits of podcasts and uh, how they vary so greatly from the radio show. Obviously, when you're on the radio, you're on the radio from a certain time, 12 to 3. Uh, with podcasts and YouTube streams, you have a little bit more freedom to listen to them uh, whenever you please. And I was so appreciative of the people who took the time to send a text message just to say, hey, man, listening, was a big fan of the lowdown, and, and here we are, we're doing this again. Uh, 916-888-5898. Again, that's 916 888 Five eight nine eight. Shoot me a text. Let me know you're out there. And I, I think you can also leave voicemails there on that number. I was asked one of the questions that came up a lot uh, during the various text conversations were, uh, are you ever going to take phone calls? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Eventually, we're going to take phone calls. Uh, another question that came up a lot was, are you ever going to do the show live? Uh, the answer to both of those are yes. Uh, in time, we'll do a live video stream. And during that same time, uh, we'll take phone calls and do the whole bit. And we'll make it just sound like we're back on the radio again. Uh, but I still have some things to work out with that. I need to get the podcast studio set up here in the front room of my house. I need to make that a little bit more pretty and friendly for a YouTube stream. Uh, and I want to make sure that I have um, a system set up perfectly uh, to be able to take calls. Guests are going to be a factor here in the show as well. So the goal in this has always been to make it sound as close to a just just a regular radio show. Like I, I was away for two weeks. Well, let's just pick up right where we left off. Let's just do a radio show. It's called a podcast, but let's just make it a radio show. We're going to get some people's attention here, man. We're growing this thing from scratch. So to those who rated uh, the podcast on whatever platform, to those that subscribed on YouTube and to those that left reviews and comments and thumbs ups and hearts and all of that stuff, man. Thank you so much. That's really going to help us get noticed. If you haven't done that yet, uh, please do that. And if I haven't won you over yet, man, maybe I can. Maybe I could do that today. So 916-888-5898. Uh, send your text messages there. Send your questions, thoughts, concerns there. I think you can even leave voicemails there. We'll figure out how to work those into the show as well. We have no NBA Finals game tonight, but that doesn't leave us uh, short of storylines leading into the game. Uh, we'll get into the Kawhi Leonard subplots here in just a few minutes. There's a LeBron James story here on June 4th because, of course, there is. There's always a LeBron James story. So we'll have that coming up. Uh, the Blues, even the Stanley Cup last night. The Panthers got a new player. I'm going to talk about that. Roger Goodell talked about the uh, NFL preseason. We'll have that on the way. And I mentioned uh, the text that came in yesterday. Lots of great questions came in through the text. Uh, we'll dive into some of those. Some of them uh, were about the Sacramento Kings. Uh, some of them were about the Houston Rockets. Got one that I really want to touch on about Andy Ruiz Jr. and the upset of Anthony Joshua. I think I really dropped the ball uh, during our discussion of that yesterday. So we'll get to all of that again. Text the show 916-888-5898. And if you haven't yet subscribed on whatever platform you're listening to, 
please do that. Hit the five-star review uh, as well. I would greatly appreciate that. You can connect with, connect with me through all social media platforms, at Damien Barling. That's Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram as well. Clay Thompson is questionable for tomorrow night's Game 3. I, I guess that's good news. Uh, he looked... There was a clip of the locker room, or not the locker room. It was like it was the hallway in in the in the locker room area where Clay Thompson was just iced up and he and and he wasn't moving well. Now, of course, he might not have been moving well because of how tightly uh, his leg was taped up with the ice on it, man. But I saw that and thought, dude, he's not not gonna be ready for Game Three. Like he's he's not moving very comfortably. The same with uh, Kevin Durant, but. Man, you talk about an embarrassment of riches. If Klay Thompson is out and Kevin Durant is out, are you 100% sure that the Toronto Raptors will win Game 3? I mean, think about a, a, another team in the NBA where two of their, arguably their very best player, and I believe that is Kevin Durant, an extremely important player in Klay Thompson. Is there another team in the league where you can go, okay, we're going to rule those two guys out in an NBA Finals game, not a regular season game, but an NBA Finals game, and you're still not 100% confident that their opponent is going to win. And then you got Kevin Looney. Now, Kevin Looney, fractured collarbone, uh, he's 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 out. He he's out likely for I mean, he's out for the remainder of the NBA Finals. Like, come on, that's the that's the injury Tony Romo had. I know Romo came back. I think didn't Derek Carr have the same injury as well? Maybe it wasn't labeled a fractured collarbone, but in a sense, isn't that what it was? Uh, he's not coming back. And that makes DeMarcus Cousins' play in Game 2 that much more important. Like Kevin Looney is a very, and has been a very serviceable player, a more than serviceable player uh, for the Golden State Warriors, not just uh, through the Western Conference Finals, but really through this run here in the NBA playoffs. And you go, okay, well... It sucks. We feel bad for Kevin Looney. We lost Kevin Looney. But we've got an Olympic gold medalist and a multi-time all-star coming back into the lineup. He had a hell of a game, too. And we'll just use him to take his place. Man. Must be nice. A lot of people think that the outcome of Game 2 may affect the way that the Warriors approach Game 3 in terms of because the Warriors were able to walk away with a win in Game 2, thanks to Andre Iguodala's late Game 3, that perhaps the Golden State Warriors will consider uh, minimizing the use of Klay Thompson and eliminating the use of Kevin Durant uh, altogether. Now, here we are. It's it's Tuesday. Game's tomorrow night. We haven't been told whether Kevin Durant is going to play. I don't even think we've been told if Kevin Durant has been cleared for practice. We're watching every piece of film on it, on him, like it's the most important film in the world. And there's so many, you know, I mentioned the the Kawhi Leonard subplots that we're going to get to here in just a minute as it pertains to the NBA Finals. Well, one of the biggest subplots of the Finals is Kevin Durant and his future with the Golden State Warriors. I wonder if this had happened to Kevin Durant last year, what would the conversation, would the conversation be any different? Like if, you knew for an absolute, like Kevin Durant's playing for the Golden State Warriors next year. That's not a conversation. Would what we're talking about today, his injury status, his availability, how soon should he come back? How quickly do they got to get this done? How much of that would change? Would it be exactly the same? Would it be a little bit different? Would the Warriors be like, nope, we're not rushing him back. Uh, We're not concerned about it. He's just got to get himself healthy. We're not going to risk his long-term future. Is Kevin Durant thinking, I'm not going to risk my long-term future. I'm just going to lay back. I mean, because Kevin, it's not like Kevin Durant needs to prove something to anybody. It's not like Kevin Durant's value on the free agency market here coming up at the end of this month is suddenly going to plummet if he doesn't play in the NBA Finals. That's absurd. He's universally agreed as being one of the top one, two, three, four players in the entire league. That's not changing if he doesn't play another game this season. But it feels like there's this sense of urgency to get Kevin Durant back on the court. And I don't know if that's there uh, just because the media is thirsty. 
and we need a story. And we're trying to find an angle, and I think this might be the biggest reason. We're trying to find an angle where we don't believe the Golden State Warriors are going to win. I feel like that's been the story through the entire NBA season. Because we've been talking all year, like, oh, the Warriors, they're not as good as they were. Oh, something feels something feels off with the Golden State Warriors. Like, ah, oh, I'm not sure... I'm not sure Steve Kerr's talking about him. He doesn't feel like they're in a flow. He doesn't feel like they're in a rhythm. He's not happy with this. They're still winning games. Still winning games. Steve Kerr was talking about, nah, it's not there. Defense isn't there. This team is slacks a days ago. I I don't like the direction that we're going. And we saw Steve Kerr's words from very, very early in the season, 10 games into the season, manifest themselves over and over and over and over again. And we kept trying to create ways. Remember the 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 on the spat between Draymond Green and Kevin Durant that led to I think Draymond Green was suspended for for a game. Oh man, we ran with that hard like is this is this the downfall of the Golden State Warriors? Did Kevin Durant just mouth the words that's why I'm out. That's why I'm out of here. Oh, we ran with that so hard because we're trying to create a, a scenario in which we can convince ourselves that the Golden State Warriors aren't going to win. I did that, but I didn't do it because of the dysfunction or apparent dysfunction or chemistry issues or whatever of the Golden State Warriors. I did it because I thought the Milwaukee Bucks were really good. And after seeing the Milwaukee Bucks in person, I thought, oh, that team, that team can win. That te-. But I desperately wanted a team to be able to challenge the Golden State Warriors. I didn't think that the Toronto Raptors had the depth. I think you could argue that they have, you know, Kawhi Leonard and Giannis Antetokounmpo are certainly on par in terms of uh, the caliber of players that they are being equal across. You know, when you rank the best players in the league, those two are right up there. But I thought the Bucks were deeper. Now the Toronto Raptors beat them up four games straight. You know, it was a six-game series, but they beat them up for four straight games, and now they've earned the right to play the Golden State Warriors, in which they beat the Warriors in game one. Played a hell of a game there in game two, but I keep hearing people say today, well, the, the Raptors just lost their opportunity. They just lost their opportunity to win the NBA Finals because of Andre Iguodala's late game three. And I think that's a that's a bit premature. To call the series after... like I th- Didn't we learn our lesson with that? Because remember how many people were... I don't even think people were penciling in the Milwaukee Bucks after winning not not the first two games after winning the first game people were penciling in the Milwaukee Bucks the trendy thing to say was the Milwaukee Bucks were going to win the NBA championship not that the not that the Milwaukee Bucks were going to represent the Eastern Conference but I heard Reggie Miller say it we all heard Charles Barkley say it I said it but you know I said it after the Kings game so I'm kind of in a different category here I'm a trendsetter, if you will. I'm joking. But we saw everybody jump on the bandwagon of the Milwaukee Bucks. And after one game, they were sharpied in to steal a line from Seth Davis in his NCAA tournament coverage. Sharpied in. And then they went on to lose. They had them sharpied in after one game. They go on to win two, man. It's a foregone conclusion. We're breaking down matchups here between the Milwaukee Bucks and the Golden State Warriors, and we're talking about, well, can Toronto get one? And then Toronto got the next four. And I'm hearing the same thing today, and I've heard it since the conclusion of game two. Well, that was the Raptors' chance, man. They had a chance to win two games at home, to head to Oakland with the opportunity to steal one and be up 3-1. And... We've already written them off. Well, the Golden State Warriors, they're going to win their next NBA championship. Doesn't really matter if Kevin Durant comes back or not. Doesn't matter if Klay Thompson is healthy. I can't believe how many times I heard that today. And I get it's kind of a slow time in in sports. Like you can manufacture stories for the NBA Finals. Or you can break down the Major League Baseball draft. I don't mean to knock the Major League Baseball draft. I'm actually fascinated by the Major League Baseball draft. It's so different than any other draft in sports. It's like you're drafted by the Oakland A's. You're drafted by the San Francisco Giants. You're drafted by the New York Yankees or the Boston Red Sox. But you don't really play for them. 
yet. You've got to do a few other things first. I'm, I'm, I, I find it fascinating. It's interesting in that sense, but I don't find it super interesting uh, to come on our radio show slash podcast here and break down. So the NBA Finals are still a hot topic. And the NBA is going to remain a hot topic because when the Finals are over, we're going to head in. Remember, we haven't named an MVP yet or a most improved player or a sixth man of the year or a coach of the year because they have this horrible, horrible idea of having an award show somewhere in late June. So it'll be a little bit of a conversation there. And then, of course, June 30th, Free agency. We've got the draft mixed in here with all of this as well. So the NBA is going to remain a topic. The Golden State Warriors are going to remain a topic. Knocking off the Golden State Warriors are going to remain a topic. And all of these free agents are going to remain a topic. But for now, we've got to manifest these stories. We've got to come up with something. What is our line? What is our way to get into this? And Well, man, if Kevin Durant doesn't come back, I think, I think the Raptors have a chance. Like that was something I heard a lot before game one. Then after game one, it was like, oh boy, man, I don't think that the Golden State Warriors can beat the Toronto Raptors without Kevin Durant. And then the Warriors win game two. I don't think the Toronto Raptors can beat the Golden State Warriors. That was their chance to win. It's like, we can't make up our mind. We change it every day. I'm not conceding this series one way or another. I thought what Toronto did in games one and game two were very impressive. They got hit in that third quarter with that patent Golden State Warriors just barrage of punches. They got punched in the face. And they couldn't recover. They never recovered from that. They made a great run there in the fourth quarter, but it was too late because they were fighting from behind the entire time. They had one more stop that they had to make. They made a series of stops to get to that moment, but they had one more that they had to make and they couldn't do it. And Andre Iguodala made him pay for it. And now the conversation, (laughs) now now there's a conversation about Andre Iguodala being a Hall of Famer. Like, man, we are really searching for stuff here to talk about. Andre Iguodala is a, a fine basketball player. He's very, very good basketball. He's a first ballot Here's a call back to the lowdown. He is a first ballot Hall of Good player. For sure. 100% first ballot. Unanimous induction into the Hall of Good. He's probably a Hall, he's probably a Hall of Fame player. I think. But that's what we're debating after he hits the, the deciding basket or the clinching basket. It wasn't even a game winner. What do you even call that? The, the, the nail in the coffin basket? Because they were up. That basket from Andre Iguodala just put the game out of reach given where the uh, game time was on the clock. So we keep looking for stories. We keep looking for stories. Now we got this one. Kawhi Leonard. This is a report out there from uh, TSN, uh, the Sports Network in Canada. Multiple sources say that Kawhi Leonard has purchased property in Toronto. Doom, doom, doom. Did Kawhi Leonard just tip his hand? Did Kawhi Leonard just tell us where he's going to play next season? Is Kawhi Leonard staying with the Toronto Raptors? Regardless of the outcome of this series, is Kawhi Leonard staying with the goal, uh, with the Toronto Raptors? I love this, man. This is fun. I love the free agency time, man. We're looking into real estate records. We're looking into, I remember when they they tracked uh, Dan Gilbert's plane in Cleveland to, to see where he was going, and he was going to meet with LeBron James, and he like tweeted a photo of, of his backyard and said, nope, guys, sorry, I'm, I'm hanging out in my backyard. Meanwhile, he was actually on the plane that was being tracked. I don't remember if he was in Miami or L.A. or wherever he was to meet with LeBron James. But, man, we really dig in. We really dig in here to try to see if free agents have tipped their hand. Have we dug in to see what what Kevin Durant has done lately? What is Kevin Durant doing with his real estate investments or his financial investments? Subplots, man. 
Clay Thompson, another subplot. Free agency. We keep looking forward to what's next rather than enjoying what's now. Like, as soon as the Philadelphia 76ers lost, what was the conversation? Where are they going to fire Brett Brown? They lost Jimmy Butler, right? Jimmy Butler's gone. Tobias Harris gone. How different? And I'm guilty of it. Like, don't, you know, I'm not trying to absolve myself here. We had these same conversations on the radio. That's one of the first things you do is kind of post-mortem with the team that's eliminated. What's next for the Philadelphia 76ers? Well, are they going to lose Brett Brown? Are they are they going to lose Jimmy Butler? Are they going to lose Tobias Harris? Uh, are they Is Ben Simmons going to be traded? And there's six degrees of separation with LeBron James and the Los Angeles Lakers or six degrees of separation with the New York Knicks. So we have to work them into every basketball conversation. Is Ben Simmons going to be traded to the Los Angeles Lakers to play with LeBron James? We can't even, we're not even at the post-mortem point of the finals and we're talking about what is Kevin Durant doing next? What is Kawhi Leonard doing next? Well, they say Kawhi Leonard just bought some property in Toronto. What does that mean? Maybe maybe he likes the real estate market there in Canada. Maybe he's investing. He's got a lawsuit to fund because that's another subplot that I wasn't expecting here to manifest itself in the NBA Finals. Kawhi Leonard is suing Nike uh, saying that they copyrighted his claw logo without his permission. Now, apparently the claw logo is something he created Uh, during his time uh, in college, something that he created over a number of years. Uh, And I don't know the legal process here. If he licensed it to the Jordan brand and Nike to use as part of his marketing, or if he was just like, hey, look, I created a design. Nike took it, put it on his shoe, and in turn copyrighted it. But again, uh, Kawhi Leonard's full of surprises, man. I was surprised when he was leaving the Jordan brand, period. New balances with him. The Jordan brand doesn't have the... The cachet of being on Team Jordan is that you're on Team Jordan. Michael Jordan selects the guys that he wants on his roster. And he has... If I, to what I understand, because I've ha- I've had these discussions uh, with people in the organization before, and if I remember this all correctly, Jordan gets first dibs, and if he wants a particular guy on his roster, if the Jordan brand and Nike, because remember it's the same company, if if J- Jordan and, and Nike both want a particular player, then Jordan has the first rights to go after him meaning he can negotiate with them first. But the downside to that is, one, you're always wearing the Jordan logo, even if they throw in uh, a claw. Chris Paul had a specific logo. Uh, Carmelo Anthony had kind of a specific logo and a pattern. But the Jumpman was always going to be on there. And the pay for the Jumpman brand was significantly lower. I think, if I remember correctly, when uh, Kawhi... Uh, said he wasn't going to resign with the Jordan brand. It was reported that maybe three and a half million a year for for Kawhi for his shoe deal, which is it's shockingly low for a player of Kawhi Leonard's caliber in terms of on the court. But is it shockingly low for Kawhi Leonard's personality? Because Ka- Kawhi Leonard doesn't have a big personality. And I, and maybe personalities don't sell shoes. Like I I don't really know. Like Kyrie Irving has one of the best selling shoes in in basketball. He has one of the best selling basketball shoes. They're super comfortable. They're a little small for me. I can't rock them. But all the all the ball players I know love them. KD same thing. KC KD's got a personality. Oh, KD is this. He is that. Uh, he's a snake. His shoe his shoe sells, man. That KD shoe sells. It's a good look, and it's a good fit. So his shoe sell. I don't know that personalities are, are big sellers. Kobe Bryant, I think, still has one of the top-selling shoes in basketball. Kobe's shoes are ultra-comfortable. I'll take a Kobe over any, any brand that's out there right now, any player's signature shoe that's out there right now. LeBron's are getting a little bit better, but they're still heavy. Even his fly knit joints are still heavy. LeBron's shoe are, is built 
for three guys. LeBron, Zion, and The Rock. If you're not 6'8", 250, and that shoe ain't for you. It's too heavy. And his early shoes, man, they, they were like cinder blocks. They were made for him and only him. But Kawhi says, uh, here's actually a quote from the lawsuit right here. In 2011, just after being drafted to the National Basketball Association, Kawhi Leonard authored a unique logo that included elements that were meaningful and unique to him. Leonard traced his notably large hand, and inside the hand drew stylized versions of his initial KL, and the number that he had worn much of his career, the number two. The drawing Leonard offered was an extension and continuation of drawings he had been creating since early in his college career. Several years later, as part of an endorsement deal with Nike, Leonard allowed Nike to use on certain merchandise the logo he created while Leonard continued to use the logo on non-Nike goods. So there you have it. Kawhi Leonard is suing over the logo. That's interesting. Uh, Intellectual property is... Is fascinating. Uh, It's fascinating in terms of you have to argue over who created it. And you have to argue over who popularized it. And if he didn't trademark this logo right away. like Because if you're Kawhi Leonard, you're arguing, I popularized this logo. People bought it for me. Kawhi Leonard, this is my logo. People bought it for me. And if you're Nike, you're going, yeah, because of us. People bought the logo on our merchandise. People weren't buying Kawhi Leonard merchandise. They were buying Nike merchandise. This is a fascinating lawsuit. I know like, to dig into the intricacies of it, it's probably boring, but I'm, f- I'm going to be fascinated by the outcome of this because I've never heard this before. There has to be some written agreement somewhere. And if Kawhi created this, we had heard so much during the tail end of the San Antonio Spurs stuff about Uncle Dennis and the team that that LeBron, uh, excuse me, uh, about Uncle Dennis and the team that Kawhi Leonard kept around him. And I did no one did no one trademark this? Did no one send that logo in for copyright? Because. If they didn't, man, Kawhi's going to have a tough time fighting Nike here. Because they had a partnership, and if Kawhi, if they trademarked the, the, the logo, then I, I, don't know what, I don't know what argument Kawhi Leonard has here. But as I said, I'm, I'm fascinated to, to see how that turns out. So these are a couple of stories I did not expect to see today. Kawhi Leonard lawsuit and uh, Kawhi Leonard buying property in Toronto. All because game three isn't tonight. It's tomorrow. So we got to fill time until the next game of the NBA Finals get here. And I imagine at some point today, we're going to find out uh, Kevin Durant's status. We're going to find out if he practiced uh, in Oakland today. We're going to find out Clay Thompson's status again. Clay, Tom- Clay Thompson, according to Shams, is is listed as, or he's, I'm sorry, he's going to be listed as questionable. Kawhi was, con- uh, uh, there's too many Ks here, sorry. Clay was confident that he was going to be able to play in Game 3. So we'll see how that plays out over the course uh, of the next few hours and leading into uh, Game 3 of the NBA Finals. Another NBA story here, Bill Plasky of the Los Angeles Times, because you can't talk about the NBA without forcing LeBron James into the conversation. Here's what Bill Plasky wrote, uh, Bill Plasky of the Los Angeles Times. I'm hearing that if they whiff on free agency and if they whiff on a trade, which I don't know how likely that is, but if that happens, they've got big trouble with LeBron. Why would LeBron, I mean, the LeBron era could be over before it even starts here. The here he's referring to is Los Angeles. I heard this for the first time yesterday. Somebody very connected said, you know what? If they whiff, LeBron's going to say either I'm out of here or get me out of here, or the Lakers better just might as well just get him out of there. Okay, that's from Bill Plasky. Didn't LeBron address this already? Didn't he address this like a few weeks ago? 
where he was like, I'm I'm here. Like I signed here for four years. We're we're good. Didn't he like tweet a smiley face or a thumbs up or something when the Lakers got the what is it, the fourth pick of the NBA draft? So has has something changed? Now I'm starting to hear you know who would be an ideal LeBron James teammate. You're hearing the same thing. It was all over TV this morning. Kyrie Irving. Oh, we're doing this again, huh? So what is what like what does Kyrie do? Go, yeah. Grass wasn't greener on the other side, dog. I'm here. What do you want to do? Now, I think that's a good move. I think that's a that's an ideal situation for the Los Angeles Lakers because they don't have to they don't have to trade anybody to get Kyrie. They just sign him outright. That's that's a great look for the Los Angeles Lakers. But is that really where Co- uh, Kyrie's head is at? Like, yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go back and play with LeBron. I keep saying in my head, and I'm gonna say this to you: There's no way Kevin Durant or Kyrie Irving is going to play in Los Angeles or uh, uh, is going to play in New York. I keep saying that over and over again. Those guys aren't going to New York because I refuse to believe that any free agent of that caliber is going to sign with a team owned by James Dolan. Now, at the same time, I've discredited Magic Johnson for his role in, quote, landing LeBron James. Because we heard so many rumors and so many rumblings about LeBron James signing with Los Angeles. And it felt like all of those rumors uh, were proven true when he signed what, like a handful of hours into free agency through a very quiet press release from Clutch Sports that he was going to play with the Los Angeles Lakers. It was just like, yeah, okay, it's not really surprising. We've heard this for like a year or like a year and a half. And you could say the same thing about Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving in New York. Like if they sign on July 1st, or I guess it's June 30th now, in New York... I think most people can go, yeah, this isn't surprising. We've talked about this for a year, a year and a half. I'd still be surprised. And maybe that's just because I think James Dolan uh, sucks beyond description. Here's some breaking news. Hey, this is the first time we get to do breaking news here uh, on the podcast. This is exciting. It used to happen all the time uh, from 12 to 3. Uh, Nothing monumental here, but uh, it is worth reporting that Shams has tweeted, David Griffin and the New Orleans Pelicans have begun listening to teams about uh, potential trades, including Anthony Davis. Again, uh, that is from Shams there. That's a... Again, not... that This isn't... Uh, it's news. And I guess, you know, by definition, it is it is breaking news because the last that we heard, David Griffin had a had a very cordial meeting with Anthony Davis and Rich Paul, and the belief was, or the reports were, that Anthony Davis' stance on being traded uh, hadn't changed yet. And there was no anticipation that Anthony Davis' stance was going to change. And that communication between uh, the Anthony Davis camp, most likely Rich Paul and David Griffin, would continue. Uh, I guess David Griffin has gotten to a point. David Griffin, a guy who I have a ton of respect for and believe he's going to be a fantastic general manager uh, for the New Orleans Pelicans. I believe he's in a really, really tough spot there because just of what that organization is, because of Anthony Davis's wants and desires, and because they're... They got to win over a fan base, man, and they've got the number one overall pick. Perhaps they can do that with Zion Williams. Perhaps they can get 100% behind him, but... Uh, David Griffin now is going to be tasked with making the biggest trade uh, in that franchise's history. Remember that franchise also had Chris Paul, but they're, they're, he's going to make the the biggest the biggest trade in in that franchise's history, while at the same time trying not to make the same exact mistakes you made with Anthony Davis with Zion Williamson. I think Griffin and the Pelicans can. Uh, get a hell of a haul here. Shams is busy this morning also. Shams just tweeted that the market for D'Lo is heating up. Hey, that's good news because I'm a free agent. So can we get uh, Sam Amick, if you're listening, or Adrian Wojnarowski, can you tweet about me? Is the market heating up for me? They were actually referring to a a different D'Lo here. D'Angelo Russell 
Uh, Nets, Jazz, Magic, Wolves, and Pacers are among teams expected to show significant interest in D'Angelo Russell when free agency gets underway here in just about 26 days or so. So how about that? Our first bit of uh, breaking news and breaking stories here uh, on the podcast. If you want to take part in the show, you can. Many ways you can do it. You can text us here at uh, 916-888-5898. That's 916-888-5898. You can connect across all social media platforms as well. If you're not a subscriber yet on YouTube, man, that would be awesome. Uh, YouTube is really into subscribers, and they are really into time spent listening. Uh, So the more that you listen to the stream over there on YouTube and the more subscribers we get, uh, the more likely we're able to get YouTube's attention, uh, make some money here for this podcast, and, uh, man, we're just going to keep growing this thing. We'll put some advertising. Once we start making some money here, man, we'll put some advertising out. Maybe we'll air some commercials during Kings games. We'll spice up the equipment here. Maybe we'll get a better studio where I could have guests in. I've already told uh, uh, my man Kurt. Kurt was our first texter yesterday. I told Kurt, man, you could come in here, hang out during King season, uh, and we could talk about the Sacramento Kings. And I know that people are happy, at least uh, given the social media response and given the text line response here. People were really thankful to have uh, local personalities back, you know, in the afternoon. And I know, you know, part of that comes discussing the local team, and there's not really much to talk about. It's June 4th. There's not a lot to talk about uh, with the Sacramento Kings right now. Now, of course, that's going to change. Uh, unfortunately, there's not going to be a big conversation around the draft unless you want to analyze a whole bunch of second round draft picks, which we certainly will. Uh, but that will really change when free agency rolls around and that will change when the California Classic and Summer League and all of that good stuff uh, rolls around. And of course, we'll talk about the Raiders and the San Francisco 49ers. I did follow the uh, A's uh, win streak. Uh, while I was away. Uh, Nice little 10-game win streak for the Oakland A's, but things have kind of leveled out for them uh, since that streak uh, came to a conclusion. So please uh, text the show. As I mentioned at the top, you can leave a voicemail as well on that same number, 916-888-5898. That's an easy number to remember, man. That's why I picked that one. Uh, 916-888-5898. You can also email damianbarling at me.com. Connect on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, as well the blues they even uh the stanley cup playoff yesterday uh and they wasted no time getting going Perron with it again carries into the corner swings it out to the right point for petrangelo and then across for a shot kicked out by rask stuff attempt score ryan o'reilly 43 seconds in blues lead one nothing 43 seconds in it didn't take long before the score was tied two minutes later it was 2-1 uh, but it got hectic there for a while before a familiar name. Well, he got going again. Bergeron knocks it out. Gunnarsson has it. Kicks it onto his stick. Rick wide for Petrangelo. Back across for the right circle. A shot. Save. Rebound. Score! Ryan O'Reilly! His second of the game! 3-2 St. Louis! Ryan O'Reilly there in the St. Louis Blues radio network. St. Louis was able to score an empty netter. As well, they outshot the Boston Bruins 38-23 to in that game. And now the Stanley Cup is all even. I'm not a massive regular season hockey fan. But Stanley Cup, Stanley Cup playoffs, that's up there. Stanley Cup finals, man, that's as good as it gets. That is as good as it gets right there. Gerald McCoy signed with the Carolina... Oh, I'm sorry. Gerald McCoy is expected to sign... Uh, with the Carolina Panthers, according to the MMQB's Albert Breer. Uh, McCoy's deal is for one year, $8.5 million. I believe most of that is fake. Uh, Actually, not most of it. I think he's guaranteed, I think it's 6.1. So a good little deal there uh, for Gerald McCoy, who was dismissed by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Not a stellar season for him last year. 17 solo tackles, uh, six sacks. Uh, Never really it's hard to put the the franchise on one guy's back unless you're a quarterback. I feel like Jameis Winston had significantly more pressure uh, to turn that franchise around than Gerald McCoy did, uh, but they just did not win uh, when Gerald McCoy 
was there, and he's 31 now. He's fallen off a little bit. I'm fascinated by the signing uh, by the Carolina Panthers. They've had a they've had an interesting off season. I I think it's because I I really bought into Carolina last year right before. Actually, it was the week of Cam Newton's injury against the Pittsburgh Steelers where I had talked about how good they are and how they should be uh, considered a candidate uh, for the Super Bowl to represent the NFC. And that all changed really, really quickly in that shootout against the Pittsburgh Steelers as Cam Newton continued to play the remainder of the season. uh, But he he was clearly hurt and we all saw it we all watched like he couldn't he couldn't throw he was like he was like shoveling the ball forward uh Ron Rivera talked about Cam Newton yesterday part of the process of his rehab you know as far as i know you know that was one of those things that you know somebody came in and took a picture which you know we really don't appreciate because this is private property but at the end of the day um he's just going through the rehab process and, and there really is no timetable you know he's continued to, to, to work with the trainers on the side and do whatever they ask of him and uh you know he'll continue to progress and we'll see where he is you know at the end of the week am i crazy to say that doesn't sound super encouraging that there was there was nothing like if i'm a carolina panthers fan or i'm a cam newton fan so just being a cam newton fan i'm i'm not I'm not loving that. I'm not loving that at all. I, Ron Rivera was asked more about Cam. I continue to feel good about him, but again, you know, we're going to listen to what Cam has to tell us. I'll listen to what the doctors tell me and what the trainers. And again, he's going through the process of his rehab program. At some point, he's going to have to throw the football. And it just so happened that uh, the other day he did. And as I said, somebody came in and took a picture, which we really don't appreciate people snooping on what we're doing around here. Ugh. So he's more concerned with the picture than he is. Uh, Cam Newton. Well, I, I don't want to say that. That's not fair. It's not that he's more concerned about the picture. He just very obviously doesn't want to talk about Cam Newton's rehab status. Which leads me to believe, man, maybe it's not going the best. Or maybe it's going slow. And maybe we are looking at a situation where Cam Newton's not playing next year. Like, I think the most under-discussed draft pick in the NFL draft list this year is, is Will Greer. Quarterback out of West Virginia was taken by the Carolina Panthers. And there were, you remember when, was it their owner or their general manager? Some Somebody had said uh, following the season, yeah, if if we have to give Cam, Cam Newton the, the Andrew Luck treatment, like that's what we're going to do. Referring to if, if Cam Newton has to sit out for an entire season, well, then that's how we'll approach this. Like, whoa, really? Because remember, Cam had surgery at the same time Andrew Luck did a couple of years ago. And Cam started the season. Or at least was really close to starting the season. Can't remember if it was like week one or week two, but he was he was there while Andrew Luck missed the entire year. I don't know that these these two surgeries, these two injuries are related. Like he was hit by the Pittsburgh Steelers. His injury was suffered during a game, but it was was it an existing injury already because remember he was playing well he was playing very very well leading up to that Pittsburgh Steelers game and it just like his season and their season completely went to hell immediately following that but they've had a fascinating offseason like they signed Bruce Irvin you know it looks like they're gonna get Gerald McCoy here I don't know how I I like Bruce Irvin personally we got a chance to talk to him uh, when we visited training camp over the course of the last few years uh Monster of a dude, tremendous football player, but is kind. I mean, I think he's been on. This is his third team. This is his second team since leaving the Raiders. Like he's, he's just kind of bounced around here a little bit. They drafted a a, a stud ed, edge rusher in, in in Brian Burns. They drafted a tackle out of Mississippi, and then of course uh, in the third round they drafted the, the West Virginia quarterback, Will Greer. I was reading a lot, you know, you read, you read draft grades, right? None of these guys have played a single snap in the NFL, but you've, you've got to grade them on what uh, NFL minds perceive to be good drafts and bad drafts. I'm not an NFL mind, man. I don't, I don't make mock drafts. I don't study this stuff the way that those guys do. But I kind of liked what Carolina did. I, I like that they got an edge rusher. I like that they got some, some protection on that offensive line. I was concerned that they drafted a quarterback in the third round. Only concerned because I'm a huge Cam Newton fan. 
and Cam Newton plays different type of football than everybody else. And the I think the most accurate equivalent you can make is Russell Wilson, at least in terms of what he does for the team. Russell Wilson has uh, the ability, obviously, to run for touchdowns and throw for touchdowns. Cam Newton has a different type of physicality to him than Russell Wilson does. Cam Newton has a different type of physicality to him than most quarterbacks in the NFL do, with the exception maybe of Ben Roethlisberger. I don't think anybody suffers more punishment, uh, legal and illegal, than Cam Newton does. Like, Cam Newton can't buy a flag. Like There were highlight reels at the beginning of, uh, not the season that just ended, but the season before that, of Cam just getting annihilated, getting hit in the head, getting hit low. No flags, no flags. Every time you get up, like, yo, that's not a flag. You would hear uh, the official, uh, you know, the the, the uh, officials, commentators who sit in the booth in in the in the uh, replay studios. Oh yeah, that should have been a flag. They always seem to miss it with Cam Newton. I'm not a Ben Roethlisberger fan at all, but they miss a lot of calls on him too, which is why he complains so damn not so so damn much. And I can't fault him for that. That's why I it's why, it's why I don't I don't fault big guys in the NBA. Like like when you look at guys who pick up a ton of technical fouls, like you might be familiar with Demarcus Cousins, Dwight Howard used to do it, Shaquille O'Neal used to do it. Those big dudes would get hammered and not get calls. I think that's why LeBron James has upped his uh, complain ratio. I feel like that's gotten significantly higher over the years. He's a big dude. He can handle the contact. It's still contact, but because he can handle it, he doesn't get the foul call. I think that's the same uh, with quarterbacks, especially quarterbacks who initiate contact. Now, remember, Andrew Luck is a big quarterback. That's never discussed. Andrew Luck is a big dude, but he doesn't initiate contact the way that Cam Newton and Ben Roethlisberger do. He doesn't initiate the violence of football the same way that those two quarterbacks do. And because of that, he's officiated a little bit differently. And I think because Cam and Ben Roethlisberger invite that contact, they're officiated differently. And that's a problem. That's going to be a huge problem for Cam Newton coming back. like Because every hit he takes in his return is going to be looked at really, really closely. And that hit could come in the preseason. Because Roger Goodell, he was talking about the preseason yesterday and he reiterated his stance of wanting to reduce the four-game preseason schedule uh, at a time the League and Players Association have begun primary talks on the new collective bargaining agreement. He wants to reduce it uh, to two games. Now, this is strategic on his part. Good for him. I do, I do want to uh, uh, throw this in uh, as well. Uh, without revealing any details, this is a quote here from an ESPN article, without revealing any details, Goodell called it the best sign, quote, the best sign that the league and the union have already had discussions some 21 months before the CBA expires following the 2020 season. The NFL and the NFL Players Association have each postured for what I believe is an inevitable lockout that is coming up here uh, following the 2020 season. It's awesome that the two are talking. There is no way in my mind they're going to get this hammered out within the next 21 months. There are some punk cards that are going to have to be drawn and thrown out there on the table very, very publicly. There's going to be a lot of give and there's going to be a lot of take. Roger Goodell, he, he wants to reduce the, 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 the NFL preseason. Cool. That's awesome. You should do that. One, because the NFL preseason sucks. Two, you charge fans who go to NFL preseason games like you would an NFL regular season game. And three, you claim to be about player safety. We all know that that's garbage. You're not about player safety because what you're likely to do here with the reduction of two preseason games, and we talk about give and take here, is you're either going to want to have an 18-game regular season schedule, which I have never heard Anyone, any player say, yeah, let's have that. Or you want to expand the playoffs. There is no way that Roger Goodell is just willing to reduce revenue 
within the NFL by two games per team. Two games across the league. No chance he's willing to give up that revenue without something in return. Players have been talking about this for, I don't know how long. I feel like Roger Goodell has talked about this for like 10 years. Oh, yeah. People have talked about the the preseason game, uh, the preseason games for multiple years. Because we're all excited for football. You know, Jason used to say, we're all excited for football. We're all excited for football. Yay, football's here. Oh, dude, can we start the regular season? This is weak. Nobody wants to watch this. You're really excited for like a quarter or a play or a series. And then a bunch of guys come out onto the field. You don't know what you're watching. You don't know if any of those guys are going to be on your favorite team. And you 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 move on from it. Like just give me, give me regular season football. But Roger Goodell is not giving up that revenue across the league for nothing in return. And man, that is going to be the theme of... I mean, that's the theme in all contract negotiations, right? That's the theme in all, all the theme in all collective bargaining negotiations. You give and you take. In the case of the NFL, the owners seem to take a whole lot more than they're willing to give because remember, this is a league that is so concerned about player safety. This is a league that puts player safety at the forefront. Oh, we've got the best doctors on the sideline. We got a really cool blue tent that everybody looks at now when you see guys running in and out of the tent and they're being evaluated because, you know, we we don't want to evaluate you uh, for a concussion in plain sight where people can actually see that we're full of crap. Like, was it Russell Wilson? Man, I can't remember who it was. I feel like it was Russell Wilson. Ran into the blue tent. There was like a turnover or a change in downs or something, a change of possession. And within seconds, literally seconds, Russell Wilson comes running out of the tent with his helmet in his hand, gets patted on the ass by the guy that was standing outside the tent, and runs back onto the field. Finishes whatever was going on out there, completes the series or whatever, and then comes back out and walks back into the blue tent. Dude, how am I supposed to take that seriously? Come on, man. Stop that. It's, it's all for show. Everything the NFL does in terms of player safety is for show. Now, if you want to impress me here, willingly reduce your revenue without altering the pay of the football players, by the way. You keep that the same because NFL players are already underpaid as it is. Because one, I, I'm positive one thing that is going to be on the collective bargaining ta- table for the NFL PA is guaranteed contracts. That way, when we report to you during free agency and we report to you during signings, we're reporting real dollars, just like we do with the NBA. June 30th, we're going to be talking about a whole lot of money, and we're going to be talking about a whole lot of real money. When we say Kevin Durant signed for $130 million, we mean that Kevin Durant signed for $130 million. When you hear Russell Wilson signed for $140-something million, okay, wait a minute. Okay, let's break this down a little bit. How much did he really sign for? How many years is it for? Six years, $140 million. Mm-mm, no, let me see this. Let's let's look at this a little bit deeper. Okay, guaranteed is $100 million. Uh, nothing guaranteed after the fourth. Okay, so basically he signed a four-year $100 million contract. That's great money. Don't, don't get my words twisted. That is great money. But the NFL and the NFL media put out these fake contracts to look like it, they're doing something that they're not. Remember when Michael Vick signed a contract with the Philadelphia Eagles and they said, oh, he's the first player to ever sign $200 million contracts because he had done it with the Atlanta Falcons as well. Man, stop it. You, tell, you think Michael Vick made $200 million in his football career? No, he very much did not. And I'm not even factoring in all the money that he had to give back after the the whole dog fighting stuff. I'm just talking about in terms of the contracts he signed. They want you to believe that he signed these massive contracts. They want you to believe that football players sign these massive contracts. Like, no, they don't. What was the, uh, I was talking about Vontez Burfick yesterday. Didn't say Vontez Burfick signed for like three or four million dollars or something when really it's, it's not. It's like one. Again, I'm not turning my nose up at a million dollars. I'm unemployed. I'll take what you give me right now. But just report what's real. 
And I think if NFL contracts ever become guaranteed, that like then we can finally do that. And we won't be talking about five-year deals or six-year deals. I certainly, I don't even think we'll be talking about four-year deals. We'll be talking about two- and three-year deals. And those are for young players. There may be an influx of one-year contracts uh, with the with the NFL if if guaranteed contracts ever become a thing. I mean, it was I I thought that Kirk Cousins might be setting the standard for how deals are done in the NFL, at least in terms of quarterbacks. M- maybe it'll have to trickle down to uh, tackles and and offensive linemen and guards and. And wide receivers and running backs, I don't think they're ever going to sign meaningful contracts again. But I thought Kirk Cousins might have changed it for for quarterbacks, and he didn't. We just he was he was he was the only one. Three years. This is your dollar figure. It's fully guaranteed. The end. Okay. Russell Wilson. He's got the he he's got a tremendous contract. But when you he's got a tremendous real contract. But the fake one looks more impressive. It's just, it's it's not accurate. And isn't that the MO of the, the NFL? Just like, let's just spread lies. Let's just tell everybody our players are making this ab- absurd amount of money when most of them, particularly non-quarterbacks, very much aren't. Non-quarterbacks, non-guards. They're not, they're, they're making great, great money. They're just not making the money that they're telling us they're making. Which reminds me of the Calvin Johnson story. I meant to bring that up yesterday. Calvin Johnson, I guess the Detroit Lions ownership, they desperately want Calvin Johnson back in the fold. And Calvin Johnson was like, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to be a part of my family here with the Detroit Lions. If you give me back that $1 million signing bonus uh, that you forced me to give back after I retired. Because there's kind of this thing where it's like services rendered when you're a football player particularly you pretty much got your ass handed to you every single Sunday. You got beat up during practice. You got beat up during meaningless uh, preseason games. You really were, for years, the only reason to watch our decrepit franchise. Oh, you're going to retire on us, huh? Okay, why don't you go ahead and shoot us back that $1 million? That's not something that happens very often. And it's probably the most Detroit Lions thing Imaginable. So many people look at the Cleveland Browns like they've been the laughing stock of, of of the NFL. And I understand that they are the most recent 0-16 team. And of course you've got Hugh Jackson, who I yeah, this is just hard not to laugh, period. But the Browns are still so loved in Cleveland. Like people are openly rooting for the Browns. Is anybody rooting for Detroit? Like if 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 you were to label them like like the Cleveland Browns, they're the lovable losers. Uh, okay, like I know that title was taken up by somebody else, but you get where I'm going. Nobody ever says that about Detroit. Detroit had an 0-16 season too. And it was just one of those, oh, God, Detroit is so bad. I don't think the collective NFL world, especially older fans, have ever forgiven the Detroit Lions for making Barry Sanders retire. Like, the Detroit Lions made Barry Sanders retire early, and I don't think NFL fans, not Detroit Lion fans, just... NFL fans, I don't think they've ever forgiven him for it. And then Calvin Johnson retires, who's a stud wide receiver, Megatron. He's just like a real life freak of nature. Oh, yeah, you're going to retire. Oh, that's fine. You you retire, but could you go ahead and shoot us back that $1 million? Oh, now you want me a part of the organization? Absolutely. I'd love to be a part of your organization. One, give me a salary. Give me an ambassador salary. And two, give me back my $1 million that you took from me. Give me back that $1 million that you publicly asked for in return when I retired. I'm, I'm Team Megatron on this one, 100%. That guy's Jeopardy streak ended yesterday. Like That was all over social media. I, I kept thinking early in the afternoon, why am I reading... Was it James Holzhauer? I was reading... Like, why am I reading so much about this guy today? And apparently Jeopardy leaked like a clip that either insinuated he was going to lose or uh, was trying to bait you into, hey, tune in to see the end of this uh, incredible streak or tune in to see if he's able to come back from this clip that we're leaking right here. 
Um, I mean, a, a really impressive run. I remember the Ken Jennings run. I'm not a Jeopardy fan. I don't watch Jeopardy. I don't. I don't watch a lot of TV that's not uh, a live sport. Though that's going to change tonight, and I'll explain that in just a second. But I, I remember hearing about the Ken Jennings run and how impressive it is. And I know a lot of people have. I know a lot of people love Jeopardy. It's been on forever. Uh, and apparently, this guy topped the uh, per game, per match, per show dollar figure. But uh, like Ken Jennings' streak was like 74 straight wins. And uh, this James Holzhauer was 33, but he made um, about $2.4 million. He was only $56,000 shy of what Ken Jennings made in 74 games. So uh, I'll take what, what Jeopardy James did here in a heartbeat. That's, uh, that's quite impressive. Uh, connect with the show. number of ways you could do it. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do. It took us forever to get up on iTunes, uh, the iTunes link finally became active last night, I think around 640. So if you could, uh, if you haven't already, uh, search us out on iTunes, hit the five stars right there. That literally takes a split second. And if you could also, if you have a few extra uh, minute or two, uh, leave us a review. Uh, tell the world how much you love the podcast with Damian Barling. And if you don't love it, uh, just lie. Like, it's not going to hurt anybody. Just lie. Help us get noticed, man. We're going to grow this thing. We're going to blow up here on this podcast platform just as we did on the radio. You can also connect with the show 24-7. The WWE has a horrible 24-7 title. Well, we've got an awesome 24-7 text line. Uh, I've always got this iPad in front of me or the computer program in front of me uh, ready to text back with each and every single one of you. 916-888-5898. Sign your name uh, with these text messages uh, and I can lock you in, have you uh, in the contacts, and I can address you, as I'm going to do right here, uh, because we got a lot of questions and comments coming in on that text line yesterday. And the one I want to start with is from my man, uh, Joseph G, because he made a great point, and I really dropped the ball here. So, Joseph, I'm going to start with you. Uh, this is his text. So I just got to the boxing portion of the podcast, and, man, I don't think you fully understand how big Ruiz over Joshua really was. I agree it wasn't Douglas or Tyson or Douglas over Tyson, but it is significant because Ruiz is the first ever Mexican-American heavyweight champion. Mexican fans are such a huge factor in boxing. If Canelo wasn't Mexican, he would not be the guy in boxing. A name that Ruiz would be looking to defend against is Adam Kwanaki. He's the Polish Andy Ruiz. And Battle of the Big Boys would be great. Al Heyman now controls all of the heavyweight gold. I would expect uh, former U.S. Olympian Bryant Jennings to get a title shot against Ruiz uh, if Adam doesn't get it first. Uh, just a boxing fan here, man. That's Joseph G. That's a great call right there. That's a great text right there uh, for a number of reasons. One, I spent far too much time yesterday focusing on the uh, comparison of Douglas and Tyson to Ruiz and Joshua. I spent too much time focusing on the the cultural impact and people calling it one of the biggest upsets in boxing history. And one of, oh, okay, like, I'll take your word for it because more of what I was speaking of was the casual interest in it. There's casual, there was casual interest in boxing. Like, being the heavyweight champion of the world used to mean everything. Like, Ali... And I'm going, like, this is before my time. Like, you know, Ali and, and Frazier and, and all of that, you know, all the, leading up to Tyson, even Foreman during his, his short little run there in Holyfield. And then at some point, it's, it started, like, some point, I think, maybe after Lennox Lewis? I felt like it still meant something when Lennox Lewis had it. Maybe it was around that time that it just started to disintegrate into nothing. Or at least it feels like nothing. And again, I pointed out there were 20,000 people at Madison Square Garden yesterday. So it still means something. But I should have spent more time talking about Ruiz being the first Mexican-American heavyweight champion because that is a huge deal. There are reasons that uh, major pay-per-view matches are uh, centered around Mexican Independence Day and Cinco de Mayo. That demographic is carrying boxing right now. Uh, and to Josh, I appreciate you calling me out on that. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the text on that and all the boxing fans who are listening. You're 100% right. I didn't give that moment. Uh, it's just due. I spent too much time uh, poking fun at Andy Ruiz's uh, fantastic figure. 
As I mentioned earlier, a couple people had asked about calls. Uh, you could definitely call. You could call that same number, 916-888-5898. You can leave a voicemail there. We'll throw the voicemails uh, on to the show here in the coming days. This podcast is going to continue to grow. Uh, another place where I dropped the ball here, this is my man Herbert. I'm glad he caught this. I actually caught it uh, when I was going through checking the quality of the podcast after it had loaded. Uh, Herbert said, got to disagree uh, with the Jay-Z take about him putting out irrelevant music. His last album was nominated for eight Grammys. It's unheard of in hip-hop to be 50-plus and putting out the best work. Listen to 444, please. 100% right. What I meant to say at the end of that conversation about Jay-Z being a billionaire, and I was tying in Sean John, P. Diddy, and, 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 and the clothing line and all of that stuff from Sean Combs, was that it was Diddy that hadn't put out relevant music in two decades. Obviously, Jay-Z continues to put out fantastic stuff. I, I find 444 a really unique album. It's a really, really personal album. It's not my favorite. I don't know that it's anybody's favorite. Again, it's far from bad. It's tremendous storytelling. And again, it's a it's a very personal album. But with, like, I don't know what to do with it. Like, if I'm... If I'm getting hyped or if I'm working out, like I'm not listening to 444. I'm probably listening to the Black, Black Album. Or if I'm throwing a party at the house, we're making some food, we're hanging, I'm not putting on 444. Like if, if I want to look at my life and where I am, which is, is probably a good time to do that, now I'm going to listen to 444. But there's, that's, that's, it's such a unique album. It is 100% a genius album. It's just not one. Uh, that I go to over and over again. Another text here. This one about the Sacramento Kings. Uh, texter didn't sign their name. Make sure you do that. I can lock you in here to the contacts. Uh, yo, Damien, what would be a move the Kings make this offseason that tells you, A, they are continuing their move in the right direction, i.e. paying for a solid piece that makes them a factor, or B, same old Kings, uh, curious piece that doesn't fit or overpaying. Uh, I'm going to throw that question to you, and we're going to revisit it tomorrow because I want to spend more time uh, talking about the Sacramento Kings and their offseason. So take that uh, take that question into mind. Uh, what would the Kings do? And I'm just going to rephrase the text here a little bit. What would the Kings do that would have you really excited for next season? And what would the Kings do uh, that have you rolling your eyes uh, at that move? We're going to revisit that question tomorrow. Uh, one more I want to get to uh, from my man, Russell Hunt. Russell, I appreciate all your support across the various uh, social media platforms. Uh, I was listening to you talk about the Rockets and Chris Paul. Do you think Houston trading James Harden uh, is a possibility? Maybe New Orleans for Anthony Davis. Maybe throwing Clint Capella there, uh, get Davis and some draft picks. Uh, just a thought. Uh, again, that's from uh, Russell Hunt. Uh, I, I, th I know that the Rockets are telling everybody that everyone's on the table. I don't think James Harden is. Uh, I think you want to bring someone in to play with James Harden and you want to try to unload Chris Paul's money. I think the only reason they're considering unloading Clint Capella is because Clint Capella wasn't a factor against the Golden State Warriors. And we know how in the head of Daryl Morey that the Golden State Warriors are. This is all fine to talk about on social media. This is all fine to leak out to NBA insiders, but executing it is significantly different. What trade partner is going to take Chris Paul's massive contract back in return? The easy one to talk about, again, six degrees of separation between New York and Los Angeles, is the Lakers. Why? Because of something I've said for months here when discussing the Los Angeles Lakers free agency plans here at the end of the month. They're not going to go the way that they think they are. I think they're striking out, and I think they're striking out bad. Their contingency plans, in my mind, are going to be because there's Kevin Durant, Kawhi Leonard, Kyrie Irving. I think their best shot is probably Kyrie because apparently he's got this buddy-buddy relationship with LeBron James again. I think KD is out of the question, and I originally thought the Lakers were a good landing spot. I no longer think that is uh, for Kevin Durant. If he winds up in Los Angeles, I think he winds up on the Clippers. Anthony Davis, I don't know whether they're able to pull that off. If you recall, the owner of the New Orleans Pelicans said, over my dead body, will you trade the uh, Anthony Davis to the Los Angeles Lakers? So their contingency plans, I think, now consist of teams trying to unload contracts that they don't like. And you can get a superstar in that sense. I think you could probably get Bradley Beal from the Washington Wizards. I think that you could get Chris Paul from the Houston Rockets. 
And I do think they're going to sign a free agent. I think they're going to sign DeMarcus Cousins. I think we're looking at a team next year of LeBron James and either Chris Paul and DeMarcus Cousins, which that's just glorious to think about, or uh, LeBron James, DeMarcus Cousins, and Bradley Beal. Slightly less glorious, but still fun to think about, especially if you don't like the Los Angeles Lakers because you're basically sitting around waiting for that to implode. Oh, imagine LeBron, DeMarcus Cousins, and Chris Paul on the same team. Imagine that Sports Illustrated cover. I'm all in for that. <laughs> Give me that 100%. But I don't think James Harden is going to be moved uh, by the Houston Rockets, Russ. I think they're just, I, I don't think they want to, everybody's on the table except James Harden. No, they're just going to say everybody's on the table so they can field offers. Hey, uh, what will it take to get James Harden out of a Houston Rockets uniform? Send him here. Can't do it for Anthony Davis. No one can trade anything meaningful for Anthony Davis unless you know, not that you think, you know he's going to resign with you. And the Lakers obviously know if he winds up in Los Angeles that uh, he is going to resign with them. We're going to wrap things up here. Anybody got an Apple Watch? Uh, I do. And uh, the new update to Apple Watch is going to include a menstrual cycle tracking feature. Apparently, this is meeting the need uh, that many users have long called for. If you don't have an Apple Watch, don't worry. The cycle tracking feature is not only coming to the Apple Watch, but it'll also be available in the health app on iPhones when the newest operating system becomes available. That was one of the biggest announcements that Apple made yesterday. Hmm. That's cool. We'll be back tomorrow, Game 3 of the NBA Finals. Uh, tomorrow night, I'll help you get you ready for that. We'll hopefully have some more on the status of Clay Thompson. Uh, we will have some more on the status of uh, Kevin Durant. I'm excited. I The things you get excited for when you're unemployed are pretty, pretty ridiculous. As hard as I'm working on this podcast and building this podcast and trying to make it explode, I'm still unemployed, and I get excited for pretty stupid things. Like, there's no game tonight. But Jordan Peele's movie, Us, was just released on digital download. Dude, I am here for it. Us was one of those movies where it was like, oh, I'm going to see that. I'm going to see that in the theater. And then opening weekend came and went, and I didn't go. Okay, I'm going to try to go next weekend. Something came up. I didn't. And then by like two weeks in, it was, I'm not going. There's, I'm just, I'm not going to see it. I'm just going to wait until it becomes available on iTunes. Well, it's available on iTunes today, and I am here for it. You, uh, producer on the lowdown, Chris. I think he saw it twice opening weekend, and saw it three total times. Jason went to see it, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang out in front of the television and watch Jordan Peele's Us uh, tonight. Uh, I won't bore you tomorrow with a full review, or I might. I'm really excited to watch this. Chris just raved about it. Jason raved about it, too. Uh, I love Jordan Peele's work, obviously, coming off the success of, of Get Up. So uh, I'm going to sit around, and I am all about that uh, tonight. Uh, thanks again for listening. Thanks for downloading. If you're streaming on YouTube, I appreciate it so much. If you haven't yet subscribed to YouTube, please do. Subscriptions and streams on YouTube are a massive, massive deal, as are ratings and reviews over there on iTunes. So if you're a part of either one of those platforms, or no matter what platform uh, you're on, could you rate the show? Uh, I know I'm asking a lot of you, man, but I want to build this thing. This is is our podcast, man. This is our platform, and we're going to build this bad boy together. So thank you so much uh, for downloading, streaming, whatever you did today. Thank you so much for being with me. I greatly appreciate it. We'll be back tomorrow at noon to get you ready for Game 3 of the NBA Finals.